Welcome back, Cosmic. We'll, uh, we'll crack on. We're getting uh, about two thirds of the way through now, so uh, the end's getting there. Uh, hope you're still enjoying it, and we'll see how we get on today. Uh, today's chapter: If anything goes wrong. Next morning, all the dads, including any Xanadu, had to meet Doctor Jackson in a bar inside the dome, magnificent desolation. The bar was called. That was the bar was called. Sorry, magnificent desolation. I just have one or two more things for you all to sign said Dr. Drax, passing out some more forms on a drinks menu. They're mostly legal waiver forms saying that you understand the dangers of space flight and you're giving your children permission to go, so if anything does go wrong, not that anything will, you as parents will be responsible. I didn't really want to think about things going wrong, so I just concentrated on the drinks menu. I couldn't believe when all the others asked for coffees and teas. There were so many drinks to choose from. I spotted something called a cosmic quencher. I just had to order that because it was my favourite word. Dr Drax was explaining that the old mission was top secret. If anything goes wrong, not that it will, we will not admit the mission ever took place. Because, of course, if anything does go wrong, which it won't, the bad publicity would close Infinity Park. I'm sure none of you want that to happen. I said, when you say if anything goes wrong, well, what exactly could go wrong? Oh, well, you know how people make a fuss, said Dr. Drax. If someone breaks a toe or gets a headache, then people say it's too dangerous. This is our first attempt. If it doesn't go to plan, then we're not going to say it'll be better next time. We're going to deny it ever happened. Then she smiled. You're a man of the world, Mr. Digby. You understand. I do understand now, by the way. I understand, because something did go wrong. Something that Dr. Drax probably denied the mission ever took place, which means no one down there is trying to help us. No one's calling International Rescue or the X-Men or whatever. No one's scrambling a super fast rocket to come and save us. Because no one knows we're here. No one knows we were going. And no one knows we didn't get there. The Cosmic Quench had turned out to be a bucket of coke with two dollops of ice cream bobbling about in it, decorated with silver stars and a bunch of sparklers blazing away on the top. I imagined all the others were thinking, I wish I'd ordered one of those instead of my boring coffee. I suppose they might have been thinking it wasn't a dadly drink. But I didn't care about that anymore. While we were signing the forms, Eddie Xanadu kept on going on how pleased he was that he'd won. I never thought I'd go into space. Or rather I did, as a child. I watched the Apollo missions on television. And I thought, living in the space age, we'd all go into space. I was disappointed. Until now. I remember my father took me to see samples of Moonrock when it first came back. The other dads remembered queuing up to look at Moonrock too. And like how we were so disappointed because it was great. I expected it to be glowing like the moon in the sky. All the other dads laughed. Samson once said, Surely even a child knows the moon has no innate luminance, that it only shines because it reflects the sun. Mr Xanadu shrugged. We all make mistakes. And the other two nodded as if it didn't really matter. But it did really matter. How could they let the kids go into space with someone who didn't know the moon didn't have any light of its own? Before you go on a quest, you've got to make sure you've got all the skills you need. Equipment, health, magic elixir. What did he have? Nothing. He was just a big, grinning, empty-headed troll. And now we're entrusting our kids with him. I tried to say nothing. I know politeness is deadly, and yelling's not. I did try not to engage. I stood and listened quietly while he said, The most important thing is the children have decided I'm the best dad. And I will be the best dad, not just to Hassan, but to all of your children, I reassure you. Everybody clapped except for me. Before I knew what I was doing, I was on my feet saying, well, they don't reassure me. How can we let our children go into space when the man doesn't even know the moon's got no light of its own? How can we let our children go into space at all? Space isn't safe. What kind of dad lets the children go into space? They all muttered stuff about it being a great opportunity. Opportunity of a lifetime. And Samson once said, well, after all, Dr. Drax's own daughter's going. Well, said Dr. Drax, collecting in the forms, not this time. Not this time? No. In fact, Shenzhen's running a bit of a temperature, so I've decided to keep her back. It could just be a cold, but it could be the measles. Shenzhen can't go into space today because she's got a temperature. She sounded, made it sound like she was going to skip P.E., I said, but Shen Jan's the professional tycoon art. Really, Mr. Digby, there's so little for the crew to do. All the hard work will be done by the brain boxers at Drax Control. 
You know, in 1969, the Americans landed a man safely on the moon with less technology than you've got in your phone. The equipment they had now was sticks and stones compared to what I've built here. So it's completely safe. We have a policy here at Draxcam. It's called massive over provision. That means, for instance, there's 10 times as much oxygen on board than they could possibly need, twice as much fuel, even the layer of Kevlar on the module is three times thicker than necessary. So it's all three times as bulletproof. Bulletproof? Why would it need to be bulletproof? The man in the moon got a shotgun or something. Oh, you know, in case of meteors. I hadn't even thought of meteors. I said, you know, thinking about it, I don't want my daughter to go into space. It's a bit too dangerous. Yeah, it'll be a great opportunity, but she can have great opportunities on Earth when she's not going to be impacted by meteors. It does you great credit, Mr Digby, that you're so concerned about your daughter. She was already walking away when she said this, taking Eddie's anadu with her. I stood up and shouted, I'm withdrawing my permission! But legally speaking, she said, waving one of the forms in the air, you've already given your permission. Have a nice day. And she closed the door behind her. Next chapter, you don't get extra space, extra lives in space. I could barely even finish my cosmic quencher. I went over to the possibility building to look at the rocket. I thought it would make it better to see it looking so solid with its extra oxygen tanks and its extra bulletproofing. Mr Bean was there too looking up at it. I said, Mr Bean, has anyone died on this? On this particular rocket? No. This is what you call an expendable launch vehicle. You're only supposed to use it once. It's a bit like those throwaway razors. You don't really know it's expendable will work until it's up there, and by then, it's too late. The thought they were going to space in a throwaway razor wasn't particularly reassuring. It got worse. People do get killed on rockets, he went on. Gus Grissom died on Apollo 1 caught fire on the launch pad with Ed White and Roger Chafee. All right. But that was a long time ago. Things are different kind of rocket now. If you're looking for something more recent... Well, I'm not looking exactly. I was just asking... The crew of Columbia Shuttle, they all died on re-entry. There were seven of them. The crew of the Shuttle Challenger all died on takeoff. Seven of them too, all really young. I did say then, uh, thanks, you've answered my question. But there were no stopping him. And then there was the Soyuz. When the parachute didn't open, Vladimir Komarov, that was awful. He knew he had no chance. Everyone could hear him talking to his wife on the radio, talking about the kids. And uh, oh, honestly, I said, that's enough information. Thanks. And I began to walk away. Mr. Bean called after me. Going to space isn't like one of those video games. If you die, you don't get extra lives. That's when I decided I'd go and drag Florida out to the crew quarters and take her back to safety. We could walk back to Bootle if we had to. Obviously, it'd be better to go on a plane. So as I strode across the rocket tram lines on the bridge over the fire pit, I was rehearsing the speech I was going to make to Dr. Drax about how it would be better for everybody if she gave us the airfare. But as I got nearer, I could hear her shouting and saw Draxcom personnel vehicles screeching up to the crew quarters. Dr Drax was yelling and Mr Xanadu was yelling back at her, throwing his bags into the back of a car. As the car drove away, Dr Drax turned to go back in the house. Then she saw me and looked totally surprised. Mr Digby, she said, how did you know? I suppose you guessed. I should have guessed myself, of course. I didn't know what she was on about. Mr Xanadu, he's totally betrayed me. It turns out that when Mr Xanadu was cheerily taking all those photos of the penultimate, he wasn't really interested in happy smiling faces. He was taking photos of the flight simulator and the control panels. He'd sent the photographs to a toy company in Shanghai, asked them to build a full-size working replica in Farasan. Sadly for him, Dr Drax also owned the toy company in Shanghai. They told me everything. He went to them with the idea to make dolls out of you all, to sell. He was going to call them Astro Kids. Can you imagine? Where do these people get their ideas? At least no harm has been done, except to Evan Zanadu, of course. He'll be no longer the responsible adult accompanying the children into space. That honour will go to the person who came second in the competition, namely you, Mr Digby. Oh? Give yourself a moment to, for the news to sink in. 
Suddenly it seemed to take more than a moment. Somehow my brain wouldn't work. She said, Mr Digby, you mean I could go to space? I leaped over my shoulder. It was nearly a mile away, but there was nothing between me and the possibility building. It still filled most of the sky, and I was still standing in his shadow. You know, of course, what those letters say. Dr. Drax pointed at these huge Chinese letters up the side. No? They're the slogan of Infinity Park. They say, the world is my thrill ride. But that... That's what you said to me on the phone that day. That's why I specially selected you. It seemed to sum up everything I was trying to say. You know, Mr Digby, I always knew you'd be the one who'd go into space in the end. You remind me very much of my own father. You have a similar quality, a sort of childlike quality. I could hear the other children talking and laughing behind her and I could feel the cool shadow of the rocking on my back. Was it different I was going to? Was it right to send my daughter to space if I was going with her? All I had to do was say thank you and I'd be riding on the rocket. I took a deep breath and I said, Dr Drax, I know you think I'm a responsible adult, but I'm not. I'm just a boy. An unusually tall and hairy boy, but a boy. I felt better straight away. Like gravity had somehow decreased and I was sort of floating. There was all, it was all over. No more pretending. No more responsibility. I just didn't care what she said to me now. Dr. Drax smiled. She touched my hand. She said, that's exactly what I mean about you. You have the right quality. You feel like a child inside. So did Einstein all his life. And he never stopped thinking like a child. That's why he made these great discoveries. No, I don't mean I feel like a child. I mean, I really am not a grown-up. Perfect. Exactly. Anyone feels they're all grown-up is no use to this project. It's the people who feel they've got nothing left to learn. Exactly. I haven't finished school. I haven't started learning. I feel just the same way. The universe is so huge, we've barely glimpsed it. Give me someone who thinks they know nothing over someone who thinks he knows everything any day. But, by the way, take good care of Hassan, won't you? It's hard for him. He'll be disappointed that his dad's not coming. And upset, obviously, because I'm suing Mr Xanadu for every penny he's got. Oh, really? Oh, yes, I'm determined to put him in jail for what he did. Right. Was there anything else you wanted to say? I thought it probably wasn't best at that moment to tell her I'd been lying to her for weeks and I'd tricked her into putting me, age 12 and a bit, in charge of her rocket that cost a billion dollars. In fact, she says, you can sign here while you're here. What's this? It's a release form for giving me permission to use your wonderful phrase, the world is my thrill ride, in all our publicity. Just there, thank you. And it only remains for me to say, enjoy the ride. Next chapter, the real thing. As we went into the crew quarters, Dr. Drax said it was nice that I was going to see my daughter on this particular day. I wasn't sure what she meant. When I got inside the house, it was full of balloons and piled of crumpled gift wrapping. Florida shouted, Hi, Daddy, where's my present? What present? Oh, stop teasing, said Florida, grinning again, everyone. He always remembers my birthday, really. It was Florida's birthday. How was I supposed to know that? How did everyone else know? Dr Drax told everyone because she knew it was on the forms. Look what Mr Xanadu got me. It was a doll, like Barbie. But it wasn't Barbie, it was Florida in a blue Power Ranger spacesuit. It really looked like her too, like she'd been miniaturised by a wicked super magi. When you squeeze it, he says, What do you mean, weightless? Are we going to lose weight? How cool is that? Smiled Florida. And I knew right away it was one of those prototypes for his Astro Kid doll. What did you get, Florida, Mr Digby? Said Dr Drax. We've been hearing about the time you bought her the pony. Oh, really? Yes, and what about all those party games you play? Will you show us the card trick? Said Samson too. They interest me psychologically. Maybe later, but just now I'm going to give Florida a present. In private. We went into the kitchen and I said, Why do you tell me it was your birthday? You're supposed to know you're my dad, you know. 
I'm not your dad. I'm only pretending. Remember. Are you saying you've not bought me a present? I'm going to give you a birthday treat. This is it. I'm going to save your life. And I told her everything. All the stuff about the secret mission. And all the stuff about Shenzhen having the measles. Florida said. Ken Mattingly. What? Ken Mattingly was supposed to go on Apollo 13. But he was pulled off at the last minute. Just like Shenzhen because of German measles. After that everything went wrong. And they all nearly died. He suffered terrible guilt feelings for the rest of my life. Apollo 13 guilt hell. That's it exactly. They were all in terrible danger. And we're in terrible danger. We've got to get out of here. You thought it was bad. I nearly drove a Porsche. A Porsche goes at 170 miles an hour. Do you have any idea how fast the infinite possibility goes? We're in trouble. Will you owe me dad? Get me out of it. No. That's just it. I'm not your dad. I can't do car tricks. I didn't get you a pony. And I don't call you little princess. But... Ring your real dad. What for? We're in trouble. He can get him out of there. He's a dad. That's what he's for. I was thinking how simple it was. Florida would ring a dad. He'd probably go nuts. But from then on, I'd be no longer in charge. We'd have a grow. I wouldn't have to be grown up anymore. Florida said her dad was too busy and I should ring my dad instead. I said, that won't work. Besides, what can my dad do? He never goes anywhere. Your dad knows about these things. He could be here in minutes. He could... No one gets to China in minutes, Liam. He's not Superman. Cheers.